Welcome and glad you can be here on uh, this Lord's Day as we continue our sermon series in the life of Daniel called Resolute. We're actually finishing up the sermon series um, on the life of Daniel. There's more to cover in the book and perhaps next year we'll take a look at some of the prophecies and things from chapter 7 through chapter 12. But in order to tell the full story of Daniel, we, we not only have to cover the great stories of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, or to tell the story of Daniel as he's surrounded by lions and through great courage and faith in God's providence he saved. But really to tell the whole story of Daniel, to see the person, the full person, we have to finish the story by, by turning to Daniel chapter 9 and taking a look at a man who, who practiced spiritual disciplines in trying times. So if you would, I'd ask you to turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9 as we finish this series on the life of Daniel for now. What does it mean to be resolute? We've been learning as we've been studying the life of Daniel what a resolute person looks like. The definition is admirably purposeful, determined, and, and unrelenting. And certainly we see that in the life of Daniel as we've seen the various strategies and, and challenges that he's faced and how he's done it with faith and determination. But as we turn to chapter 9, we're going to see the power and behind the scenes look at where all this faith and all this courage comes from. As we'll see in Daniel chapter 9, that the secret, if you will, of his success is found in a man who was spiritually connected to his God. And so I want to suggest to you in trying times when, when a lot is going on all around us and there's a lot of pressure for us even to change our beliefs and our values that we can learn from Daniel how to be strong and resolute in our faith as we look at the life and the example of Daniel, especially in chapter 9. As we turn there to chapter 9, I want you to see that Daniel gives us an example and a model of how to pray fervently through challenging times. Look at what Daniel says in, in chapter 9, in verse 3. He says, I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with Him in prayer and petition. In challenging times, Sometimes we have to, we have to give up on, on, on ourselves and our own solutions to problems and really turn earnestly to God. Sometimes we find ourselves at wit's end, at the end of ourselves, and it's those times when we desperately need God to show up. And that's how we find Daniel in Daniel chapter 9. We see at the end of the chapter, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 20, that he, he summarizes it. He says, I was, I was speaking, I was praying, I was confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, making my request before the Lord my God. And it was at that moment that God entered into history and answered his prayer and showed him the way. Perhaps we need that too in our lives in these challenging times. What can we learn from Daniel? I want to suggest to you that there are three absolutely essential elements for us if we're going to be people that are resolute in trying times. Like Daniel, I think first of all, we have to be committed to opening up the Scripture and allowing God to speak to us. We need the Bible. I want to talk with you today about how we can experience the Bible in a, in a, in a challenging time to allow the Bible to be the fuel that helps us through challenging times. That's the first thing. The second thing is, and we'll just briefly mention it, is, is that we need to learn some spiritual disciplines to be able to fuel ourselves through these challenging times and to be able to, to understand the urgent times that we live in. And we'll talk about what Daniel did and how he experienced God through those disciplines. But we're going to focus most of the time on talking about prayer. What is it? What does it look like? And how can we pray with a greater sense of urgency in the day and time we find ourselves in? So first of all, as we open up Daniel chapter 9, we see that Daniel is a man who is carefully studying the Bible, trying to understand what God is doing in a challenging time. And do you know that his study of the Bible is what fueled him with hope for the future? Look at what he says in Daniel chapter 9, verse 2. In the first year of his reign... Now, historically we know 
that Daniel was a man who was 16 or 17, who was plucked out of his hometown of Jerusalem, and he was exiled to a foreign country, to Babylon, and he was, he was made a part of the king's service, and he was constricted in, and he served under the king, many different kings of Babylon. He, he had to get a new name, a new culture, a new way of life, a new occupation. So much had changed. It was so challenging for him. But when we find him here in Daniel chapter 9, it is like 70 years since all that happened. He is a man who is now around 86, and he is wondering, God, what are you doing? And how is all this going to end? And so he is seeking God to try and find the answers, to try to understand and have hope for the future. And where does he turn to? He turns to the scripture. Where should we turn to when we're looking for hope and answers? We should turn to the scripture as well. And notice what it says. I, Daniel, understood from the scripture. There's something special about opening up the word of God and not just reading it for content, but having the word of God leap off the page and speak to us. I think that's what Daniel meant when he said, I understood it. It's like the word of God came out of the page and hit him between the eyes and said, that's for you, Daniel. Have you ever had an experience like that? In trying times, we need the word of God. Here's what we need. We not only need to read the word of God, we need to be read by the word of God. The word of God needs to read us and our situation and, and tell us who we are and what we are and what we need. We need the word of God to speak to us just like Daniel had it. And where did Daniel find his inspiration? He found his inspiration in a prophet by the name of Jeremiah. It says that, as he was reading the scriptures, he understood from the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. Now, we say, wow, that's, you know, what is all that about? Well, again, the land had been destroyed, it had laid desolate, and Daniel didn't know was he going to live out his days in Babylon where the people of Israel never going to go back to the land. He didn't know, and he was wondering, and as he read the scripture, as he read a prophecy of Daniel chapter 25, verse 11, he understood, finally understood, that, that the land would be desolate, and that they would serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. That verse jumped out at him, he realized. And you say, well, you know, and it said it right there, why didn't he see it? You have to remember that Jeremiah was a contemporary of Daniel, and so was Ezekiel. And as Jeremiah is, is, is writing his prophecies, the, 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 the city of, of Jerusalem is being destroyed and people are being taken away. Jeremiah was, was about 39 years old when the first deportation took place. So Jeremiah is 39 and Daniel's about 17 and Jeremiah is writing on his scrolls, you know, how many times can you copy those scrolls? How many times can you get those scrolls out to people? In fact, we know from Jeremiah chapter 29 that he specifically sent a letter to the deportees, the people that were in Babylon, to tell them what the word of the Lord was to him. And in Jeremiah chapter 29, he tells them, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promises to you to bring you back to this place. Daniel needed to understand that although the past was messed up, God was still sovereign over the future. Do you believe that? That although your past could be messed up, God could still be sovereign to bring about a greater future. In fact, 70 years was exactly what God needed in order to right the wrong and to get things straight. 70 years from when Daniel left Jerusalem to go to Babylon. In 70 years, the reconstruction of the temple began. 70 years from when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple until it was finally rebuilt. 70 years is what God had in terms of bringing it all about. Some of us say 70 years is way too long. We hard, it's hard for us to wait for God to bring about a change in our circumstances. 
But that's what Daniel was longing for, to see his people come back. And as he looked into the scriptures, he understood from the scriptures that God had a promise and a plan. So many of us have a favorite verse. It's Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. And here's what that verse says. Maybe you have it on the mantel place of your home. Maybe you have it on the refrigerator of, of your house. And it reads this, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and to give you a future. Do you know that that prophecy was part of the letter that Jeremiah sent to Daniel to encourage the people there in Babylon who had waited 70 years that God still had a future for them? That's, that's waiting hope, hopefully expectantly for God to intervene. How do we find strength for trying times? We find strength for trying times by looking in the scripture to see what God's promises are for us. We know from scripture that, that scripture has been given to us both to help us live in our present life. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1 says that Scripture has been given to instruct us how to live in order to please God. And so as we study the Scripture, we can be instructed about what God wants for us and how we can please God. But in that same chapter, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, God says, I don't want you to be uninformed about the future either. And in that context, he's speaking to the church of Thessalonica and he's telling them, I know some of you are mourning because your loved ones have passed away. They're asleep in Jesus and you're wondering how they are and you're worried about the future and you're wondering how, how all God is going to bring all of this together for you. And what does he say? I don't want you to be uninformed. And he goes on to explain to them that God is sovereign over the future. And that Jesus Christ will appear in the clouds with great glory and gather his people together and will be with the Lord forever. And we're to encourage one another with those hopes. You see, the scripture has been given to us so that we can have hope in the future. In trying times, sometimes our, our patience is tested. Sometimes our hopes are dashed. But God's word speaks to us in the present to tell us, I have a future I have a hope for you. And that hope that Daniel heard helped him to gather his, his, his senses and to continue to pray for God's will to unfold even in the future. He was a man who studied the scripture and from the scripture found hope. That's the first quality that we need to have, like Daniel, to be resolute. We need to be people that find our answers for the future in the promises that God has given us. But there's another quality that we see in the life of Daniel that I'm just going to briefly mention before we get to the third one, which is prayer. And that is this. Notice it says in verse 3, So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. What is that? How many of you have a sackcloth in your closet? What's with that? Well, in Bible times, when a person wanted to have a greater awareness and dependence upon God, they would sometimes gather in a practice like this by fasting, which I think we all know means to abstain from food for a period of time. Why? By abstaining from food, we're able, we're able to be able to, to direct our, our attention away from ourselves to God. When we have hunger, that hunger reminds us of a deeper hunger we have to not only rely upon the things in life, but to turn our attention toward God. So, so Daniel, wanting to be able to, to fully put his attention on God, fasted during this time to be able to recognize that he could rest solely on God. It's not through, through the bread alone, but through the word of God that we get nourished. And so he was resting, not in his physical food, but, but turning to God and devouring God's word. And so in fasting, he was able to turn his attention toward God. But the sackcloth and ashes thing is kind of weird, right? A sackcloth was actually kind of a heavy material um, that was made out of uh, black goat's hair. And it was very heavy and it was very uncomfortable. And we, 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 we see from Scripture that from time to time, God's people would put this on and then they would cover their head with ashes to, to, to remind themselves of, of, of their need, their great need, and how desperate they were apart from God. 
how much they needed God to intercede in a situation. So, historically, Jews, when, when, when people would die, they would put on sackcloth and ashes. Or when there was a great need in society and they knew that only God could answer, they would put on sackcloth and ashes. And they would just remind themselves that, that uh, this is not something I can do by myself. Now, I want to be clear with you that these practices, these disciplines are, are not things that we do to earn favor with God. You've already received favor if you are a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Not to earn God's favor, but to turn our attention toward him, to sort of tune our minds and our hearts toward him. And that's what Daniel was doing. Daniel was searching the scripture. And rather than eating the physical food of life, he was, he was reading the scripture and getting his nourishment from the scripture and focusing himself not on his own needs, but on the needs of his people. And that allowed Daniel to turn his focus away from himself and toward his God. And as he was doing that, Daniel engaged in, in an amazing prayer that I think is given to us as a great example of what prayer looks like. You know, there are many great prayers in the Bible. Of course, the greatest prayer of all is the Lord's Prayer, right? Given by Jesus. And it's, it's a prayer not to be prayed just kind of rotely, just sort of mechanically without any thought, but it's an example. It's a model for us to pray. And so, too, there are great prayers of the Apostle Paul in the New Testament but do you know there are great prayers in the Old Testament, and this is one of them. And I think as we look at the prayer of Daniel here in Daniel chapter 9, it teaches us how to pray in trying times. What do we see as we study the prayer of Daniel? We see, first of all, that prayer is acknowledging who God is and praising and thanking Him for who He is. Look at what, look at what Daniel says acknowledges about God. Look at verse 4. I prayed to the Lord, my God. Can you say that? I mean, I don't mean just say that like the words, but I mean truly say that in your heart. That when you address the, the being who created the entire universe, you know, the one who said, let there be light and there was light. The one who said in the beginning, Voila, that one, the God of the universe, the God who knows everything about you, the God who has numbered every hair of your head, that God, can you say about the Lord of history that he is my God? Do you believe that you have a personal relationship with the God of the universe? Daniel's prayer is, is immensely personal. The Lord, my God, every one of us needs to learn to be able to say that and truly mean that and then know who this God is and who is this God that Daniel prays to. Look at some of the characteristics of God that is described here in verse 4. The great and awesome God. We throw the word awesome around a lot, right? Awesome Right? We might say, well, that was an awesome play. You know, the quarterback threw the play and, and the touchdown, and that was awesome. But awesome has this idea of being awestruck about the very thought of God. That God himself is so awe-inspiring that to be before him is to even to tremble at his incredibleness. He's, he's awesome and great. He keeps his covenant of love. He's a God of love. Daniel knew that. Daniel knew that the discipline that the people had experienced for 70 years was not because God didn't love them, but was because God did love them and was trying to direct them back to the right path. You know, sometimes things happen in our lives not because God doesn't love us. He does love us. And sometimes he uses trying times to get us back on the track of life that we need to be on. That's what he was doing in his people. And he was determined, this God, to keep his covenant of love. Daniel knew that. Daniel also knew in verse 7, Lord, you are righteous. You are righteous. That means that everything that God thinks and everything that God does is right that it's measured according to the standard of the universe and it's perfectly right. God is, is righteous in everything he does. He's merciful and forgiving. Verse 14, the Lord our God is righteous 
he says two times the Lord is righteous. And that means to remind us that, that when we're going through trying times, it's, it's not that God is, 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 is being mean or vindictive toward us. That God is right. That his thoughts are right toward you and toward me. He, he, he's right in all he does. And we rest in that. We trust in that. Because let's think about it. If we lived in a universe where God was malevolent, where God was some sort of evil dictator, we'd all be a mess. There would be no hope. But knowing that God is right helps give us hope for the future. He also expresses um, an important element that in verse 16, he says, Lord, in keeping with all your righteous ways, um, you, turn, uh, you turn your anger and your wrath towards us. Wrath. That's a biblical word, but it's not a word we use in our culture. Wrath means God's righteous anger and indignation towards sin. It means that when God sees the murder of an individual, he is righteously angry at that sin. When God also, by the way, sees the, the, the evil thoughts in my heart and in my mind, he also is not pleased with that either. A God who is right is fair. He looks at it all and he says, all of it is displeasing to me. So, so how do we please a God who's, who's righteous, who's, who's right to be angry at us for our sins? Well, Daniel understood the key was to understand that this God is merciful and forgiving. He's a God of great mercy. And Daniel understood that the people of Israel had been rightly judged by God for their years of idolatry. This 70 years of punishment was, was right that God had brought upon him. But he had great hope that God was merciful and forgiving. And part of the key for us to be in right relationship with God is to understand this God who is right to judge us is merciful when he forgives us. And when we grasp the mercy of God, it develops in us such a gratefulness for him, such an acknowledgement of who he is, that we just turn in gratitude toward him. And that's what Daniel did. He acknowledged who God was with praise and thanksgiving. Do you know this God? Do you know this God who is loving, who is righteous, who is merciful and forgiving toward you in Jesus Christ? The second thing that Daniel does in his prayer is knowing who God is, he also knows who he is. And that leads him into a prayer of confession. Notice what he says in verse 4. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. I would suggest to you that in our culture, we have a problem with confession. Just quickly doing a scan around here. Good, I can still use it. Um, there are no politicians here today, so I can use the example. You know, when politicians get up and, and they, they talk about their, well, what do you call it, indiscretions, their, 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 their things that they do, you know, sometimes you hear someone say something like this, like, if I possibly may have offended someone with what you perceive that I did, then I am sorry that you were offended by what you perceived that I did. It's kind of like a confession in our day. It's not at all like the confession of Daniel. It's not at all like the confession that you and I desperately need to make before God. Notice what Daniel does when he confesses. Notice, first of all, that Daniel owns it. He owns it. 17 times in this passage, he uses the word we. His confession is corporate. But if you notice in verse 21, he also says, confessing my sin and the sin of my people. It is both individual guilt that he's confessing, but corporate guilt. You see, sometimes in our day, we want to confess the sins of others, but not our own. We want to say, well, we have problems today because of them, because of those people. No, no, no. Biblical confession says we. Let's face it. Um, we have challenges in our culture, in our day, in our country, and, and there are a lot of problems. 
But I don't know about you, but I think we have to get beyond this us versus them and start saying we. We, Lord, come before You. We, Lord, have sinned against You. We, Lord, need Your forgiveness. We, Lord, need You to intervene in our lives. This is what Daniel does. Daniel owns it. Notice what he says in verse 5. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and rebelled. We have turned away from Your commands and laws. We have, we have not listened. We have sinned against You. On and on, he says, we. He owns it. Biblical confession starts with owning it. I also want you to notice some of the words that he uses to describe confession because this gets to the heart of what true confession is. What is he saying? He's saying, first of all, we sinned and done wrong. I think most of us have that understanding about sin. We, we know that sin biblically means to miss the mark, like to miss the standard, to, to do something that we shouldn't have done or to fail to do something that we should have done. That's what sin is, to do something wrong. But I want you to notice that Daniel also understands, and we need to understand that biblical sin is much deeper than that. Notice what he says. We have rebelled we have turned away. We have not listened to you. We have transgressed. We've refused to obey. We've not sought you. Biblical sin and understanding of sin in a biblical way goes a lot deeper than simply just saying, well, I failed to do this or that. Biblical sin understands at the heart that it is a problem of the heart and a rebellion against God. We've said to you, God, nah, I don't need to listen. I don't need to obey. I don't need to seek you. I'm rebelling. And although maybe we don't use those exact words, that's the actual reality of what our actions show. And to biblically confess our sins is to acknowledge that we have rebelled, that we have disobeyed, that we have gone against a holy God and His righteous standards for us. I want to suggest, no, actually I don't want to suggest, I want to state as clearly as I can for myself to hear and for all of you this. If you have never spoken in this language before to your God about yourself, then I, and I dare say, and I say this with humility and with with respect, I, I, if you haven't spoken to God with this language, then I don't know whether you're truly a follower of Jesus and have received his forgiveness. In order to receive the forgiveness of Jesus, there is one requirement. It is faith and repentance. It's two sides of one coin. But repentance is acknowledging that you need a Savior. It's knowing that you're lost, knowing that you have rebelled, knowing that you've transgressed, knowing that you've turned away, and knowing that without God's intervention, you have no hope. That's what biblical confession looks like. Daniel models it for us. Daniel says, oh God, I and we have strayed from you. Was there a time in your life when you recognized that about yourself? For me, it was, it was in my eighth grade, ninth grade year, I think it was in the summer, when I, when I heard the gospel for the first time and I stuck a track in my pocket so that no one around me, my friends, would see that I take, had taken it and laugh at me. But when I got home that night and opened up the track, it was like the Holy Spirit poured fire on me. And I was like, I don't know how I knew, but all of a sudden I knew I was guilty. It wasn't like I was the greatest sinner as an 8th grader and ninth grader, but I knew my heart. And I knew that I, that I had erred, that I had fallen short, that I had rebelled, and that, and that I needed a Savior. And ever since then, I have learned to confess. And boy, do I need to. And don't we all? Confession is saying to God, I know what you already knew. I know that I'm a sinner. You already knew that, God. And God, I'm acknowledging it and I'm coming clean. That's what confession is. And that confession is necessary 
to enter the kingdom of God. It's necessary to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's necessary to experience God's great mercy and forgiveness. And Daniel confesses for himself and for his people. But then comes the great appeal. After acknowledging who God is, after confessing his, his need of forgiveness, of God being a savior for him and for his people, now he says, and by the way, God, I got a big ask for you. Notice the language that he uses. Verse 4, I prayed to the Lord my God. Okay, what kind of prayer did you pray? If you look specifically at verses 17 through 19, you see the specific ask of God. And it's a great, big, big, big appeal. It's basically like, to use the language of the day, make Jerusalem great again. I mean, it had laid desolate for 70 years. It had been destroyed. And Daniel knew that God still had a purpose for Jerusalem. Daniel also saw in his prophecies in Daniel 7 through 12 that a Messiah would come, that a Messiah would bring right, that a Messiah would bring healing to the land. And he knew that God had a plan, but he wasn't sure how God was going to do it. And so what does he do? He says to God, I'm going to ask for great things. What does he ask for? First of all, notice the language he uses in verse 17. Now our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor. Look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear and hear. Open your eyes and see. It's almost like Daniel is saying, God, have you seen what I see? Have you seen the mess that's been made of Jerusalem? Now, obviously, he knows that God sees it. But there's a sense in which he says, God, I want you to see what I see. I want you to see the pain that I'm feeling about my city and its destruction. And I want you to move and act. See, sometimes desperate times calls for desperate prayers. And Daniel brings the, the whole game here. He, he's desperate. He ups the ante and he says, that desolate city that you see, I want you to make it great again. He says in verse 19, listen, Lord, forgive, heal, and act. You see, we need to believe in a God who not only hears, but can act. I want you to think about something that's really big in your life. Maybe during this time of COVID, it's... It's risen to the surface. This issue, this need in your life has really risen to the surface during COVID. If you, to use the language of Daniel, you look at it and you say, Lord, do you see the desolation? Do you see the mess? Are you ready with Daniel in the, verse, in, the, in the words of verse 19 to, to plead, to make a big appeal to God. Lord, listen, forgive, hear, and act. Are you desperate enough to let God get involved, to give it to him, to trust him, to right the wrong, to, to make straight the pathway, to, to, to take all of the, the mess and to bring it together for his time and his way, this is what Daniel prays. This is the big appeal. And this is what God challenges us in his word to do with him. We sang today, move the mountain, do it again. Do you really believe that? That God hears, that God can act in history. You say, why would God act? Here's why he would act. Look at how... Daniel ends it in verse 19. For your sake, my God, for your sake, my God, do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. Daniel understands that prayer that, that is for the glory of God and for the good of his people is in no contradiction. We can pray for God's glory and our good. As long as we're praying for something in which both can take place, we can confidently and boldly come before God and say, God, I need you to move for your good, for your glory. Please move. We can pray and make a strong appeal for God, especially in trying times. So as we close today, 
I want to ask you to focus in on, on either one of two responses. Like I said before, Daniel was a great man of prayer. And he soaked himself in the scripture. And from that, he fueled the hope that he had for the future. So I want to ask you today, maybe that's your action step. Maybe for you, you're going to say, you know what? I need to get into the word of God. I need to start devouring it. Maybe I need to take some time and fast and devour the word so that God's word can get in me and fuel me to have hope for the future for what I'm facing. Maybe that's your step today. Or maybe your step is, yeah, I just need to cast myself upon God. I need to learn to pray like Daniel. I need to learn to acknowledge who he is, to confess my needs before him, and to make a great appeal to him to move in my day, in my circumstance. I think both of those responses would be a great way to follow the example of Daniel. In these trying times, God's looking for people like Daniel's who will say, despite the changing times where we're being pressured to change our values and our beliefs, where we're being pressured to lose hope, none of that, as we stand firm, resolute like Daniel, we know the God we serve, and He can be with us, and He can guide us, and He, he can direct us. Do you believe that? Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I come before you today knowing that many here today are experiencing challenging, trying times with great burdens like Daniel. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give us faith like Daniel to be resolute, that you would meet the needs of your people today. I pray that if there be anyone here today who who truly has not prayed like Daniel to confess their sins, to recognize that they have rebelled, that you would speak to their heart and that you would convict them, just as you did me, uh, of their sin and their need of a Savior, that they would call upon Jesus today to be that Savior for them, and that in believing in Jesus, they would begin this life and journey of following him. For those of us who have, Lord, We've confessed our need of a Savior and we continue to confess our sins as, as we go through life, Lord. We, we need to know that we have hope. We need to know that you have a plan and a future for us. Like, like Daniel, we look at the de desolation around us and we say, Lord, hear and act. And so I pray that you'd give us great faith today to believe that you can do that in our lives and help us to trust you to be resolute. God, give us great faith like Daniel. For we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.